In this video, we are going to look at pipelining in the context of a CPU. Let's first consider a CPU where the individual components of hardware that are used to execute the different parts of an instruction have times as specified in the table here. In other words, the instruction fetch or reading from instruction memory takes 200 picoseconds. Reading a value from a register file requires 100 picoseconds. An ALU operation takes 200 picoseconds. Data access from the data memory, once the address has been given, takes 200 picoseconds. That is to say, data read from the data memory takes 200 picoseconds. And similarly, data write also takes 200 picoseconds. Register write, on the other hand, takes 100 picoseconds. With these numbers in place, we can now look at the time required for each of the instructions. For example, a load word instruction would take 200 picoseconds to fetch the instruction, 100 to read the register value which tells the address from which to read, 200 picoseconds to compute the address from which to read, another 200 picoseconds to access the data from the memory, and finally 100 picoseconds to write the data which came back from the memory into the register file for a total of 800 picoseconds. A store word instruction would once again have the instruction fetch, a register read in order to get the address, ALU operation to compute the address into which to store, and a data access, which in this case is actually writing into the data memory, which takes 200 picoseconds. Note that fetching the value that needs to be written into that address happened as part of the register read, and therefore both the value to be written into the memory as well as the address both were extracted from the register file at the same time in parallel. They do not need to be computed one after the other. What about the so-called R format or register instructions or ALU instructions? In this case, they would take 200 picoseconds to fetch the instruction, 100 picoseconds to read the register file, 200 picoseconds to compute the ALU operation, and another 100 picoseconds to write the value back into the register. Note that in this case, the memory does not come into the picture. What about a branch statement? 200 picoseconds to fetch the instruction, 100 picoseconds to read the register values, and 200 picoseconds to compute the ALU operation, which is the branch with condition. And once we have that, essentially all that needs to be done is to update the program counter. We do not need to access memory, and we do not need to write anything into the registers. In this case, of course, I'm assuming that it's not a jump and link kind of instruction where a register needs to be written. But for other conditional branches, this is all that you would need. The only steps are instruction fetch, read, and ALU operation. So what we can see over here is each of these operations takes a different amount of time in total. What happens if we try executing this in a single cycle manner? Let's consider a sequence of three load operations as shown in the figure. What would happen is the first load operation would take 800 picoseconds, the second would take 800, the third would also take 800, and so on. On the other hand, if we pipeline this, as discussed in the analogy with car manufacture, what we would do is we would essentially do an instruction fetch in the first 200 picoseconds. So the first 200 picoseconds would essentially be cycle one, and this would consider, correspond to a stage called instruction fetch. The second 200 picoseconds would correspond to cycle two. Over here, we would do something called the instruction decoding, which is getting data out of the registers. In cycle three, we would actually execute or use the ALU to compute the address from which to read. In cycle four, we would do the actual memory access, which would be the data access from DMEM. And in cycle five, we would write the value that we got from memory back into the register file. So what you can see over here is now the total time required to complete has now become 1000 picoseconds as opposed to the 800 that it was earlier. But on the other hand, the time between instructions is just 200 picoseconds. This of course was the whole idea of pipelining. We can get higher throughput even if we have to pay a penalty in terms of the time required to complete individual instructions. What kind of speed up can we expect by means of pipeline? 
In this case, what I have described is a five-stage pipeline, as you can see in the previous diagram. Now, with a five-stage pipeline, ideally, I would like to see a 5x speedup. In other words, the 800 picosecond instruction should ideally come down to 160 picoseconds. However, as we saw due to the individual bottlenecks that we have, that is to say things like the instruction memory fetch itself requires 200 picoseconds, we really can't bring the cycle time below 200 picoseconds. So we get a 4x speedup, 800 by 200, instead of the ideal 5x that we would like to see. But if you think about it, for an individual instruction, what has happened is we actually have a slowdown. We went from 800 picoseconds in the worst case of the load instruction to 1000 picoseconds. For other instructions, like an ALU operation, it's even worse. We would actually go from 600 picoseconds all the way to 1000. However, on average, when we start executing a large number of instructions, on a single cycle processor, if we had n instructions, we would basically take n into 800 picoseconds as the total amount of time required to execute. Whereas in a pipeline, this number would be n into 200, which is the time between the start of successive instructions, plus 800, which is the time required to complete the remaining four stages of the last instruction. Note that the last instruction actually has to go all the way through to completion. What does this mean? It means that as n becomes larger and larger, this additional overhead of 800 picoseconds is less and less significant. And our actual speed up compared to the single cycle would be n into 800 divided by n into 200 plus 800, which would tend towards the value 4, which in our case, at least, is the ideal speed up that we can hope for, given the fact that we have opted for a 200 picosecond cycle time. So to summarize, Pipelining could potentially make individual instructions slower, but in general, for a sufficiently long program, the overall throughput in terms of the number of instructions processed per unit time will go up. So in this case, what we have described is something called a five-stage pipeline. We have broken the execution of an instruction into five stages, the first one being the instruction fetch usually labeled IF, which reads an instruction from the instruction memory. The next stage is instruction decode, which involves reading values from the register file, getting them ready for whatever ALU operation needs to happen afterwards, and perhaps performing some other decode logic, deciding whether the final register update is to be done or whether a branch needs to be taken, a few other conditions of that sort. The Normal combinational logic for that could be captured in this instruction decode stage. The third stage in our five stage pipeline is technically the actual computation, the ALU execution, in other words. The fourth stage involves accessing data memory. In the case of load operations, it would be reading from data memory. In the case of store, it would be writing to data memory. And the last stage would involve the WB or write back, which basically involves writing back to the register file if necessary. Note that not all instructions write back to a register file, but we still have a stage in the pipeline that corresponds to a write back always. One of the assumptions that I've implicitly made over here is that the register file can be written and read in the same clock cycle. What that means is at the beginning of a clock cycle, immediately after the positive edge, the value in the register could get updated. Essentially, what it means is that the value that was to be written into the register file was present just before the clock cycle, and the clock cycle resulted in that particular register getting updated. The value that needs to be read out of the register file, on the other hand, effectively needs to be ready only by the end of the clock cycle so that it can be captured for use by the next stage. What this means is that if we assume that the register file is implemented in a so-called read after write manner, that is to say, whatever is written into the register file is also the value that will get read out at the end of the clock cycle, we can implement both reading and writing from the register file in the same clock cycle and can consider these effectively as 
two different parts of execution that happen within a single clock cycle. With all of this in mind, let's look at what the pipeline structure or execution for an add type operation looks like. The notation that I'm using here, which of course is directly from the book by Patterson and Hennessy, is that if a portion of a box is shaded, it essentially corresponds to, indic to an indication that that particular hardware unit is operation in either the front half or the back half of this particular cycle, or perhaps in the entire duration of the clock cycle. Over here, what it means is that we are, for the IF stage, we are reading from IMEP. And as we know, the read operation, the result of the read operation needs to be ready by the end of the clock cycle, which is why the shaded portion is the second half of the IF block. Of course, as far as instruction memory is concerned, we are never going to update it. We are never going to write a new value into the instruction memory. So the front half of the IF block is never going to be shaded, but we are doing this just for consistency with the other blocks. In the instruction decode stage, we are going to do a register read. And this indicates why this latter half ID is shaded so just to jump a little further ahead, the analogy is that in the write back stage, we'll do a register write, which corresponds to the front half of the same register file. The EX stage on the other hand corresponds to ALU operations and the assumption is that it is busy for the entire clock cycle. And in this case, since it's an add operation, the memory stage does not do any work we do not need to access external memory. However, the pipeline stage still exists. We cannot just eliminate it just because the add instruction does not need to go out to memory. Why? Because we need to make sure that the overall operation is maintained in a completely regular manner. And if we try removing one of the stages in between, it will end up clashing with some other instruction that comes later. Now, all of this describes how pipelining could be implemented, at least in principle, in the case of a CPU. However, there are some very important problems that arise as a result, and we need to look at them. These problems are usually called hazards, and there are three types of hazards, structural, data, and control. We'll look at each of them in the coming slides. A structural hazard is something where two different instructions are trying to access the same hardware. An example of this would have been if we had a situation where we had only a single memory that was used both for the instructions as well as the data memory. Now, if all that we were doing was running ALU operations and perhaps branch instructions, this is not really a structural hazard because after all, there is no data memory to be accessed at all. And we do not have any problems. All the instructions could execute the same way. What about if we had a situation where we needed to have store instructions? If we had store instructions, we would still not have a problem provided that we were able to implement some kind of a read after write type of memory. Essentially what it would mean is that the IMEM read would always happen in the second part of the clock cycle, whereas the store, if required, would have happened in the first part and they would not really conflict with each other. However, the moment you have a load instruction, it means that we are potentially trying to read from two different memory locations. One corresponds to the next instruction location and the other corresponds to the location from which we want to do a load data. This is a structural hazard. In our case, it does not apply because we have already made a choice that our instruction memory is separate from the data memory. In practice, of course, most personal computers or most computers that we are aware of have only a single memory, which is used to store both instructions as well as data. However, internally, these are usually supplemented using some kind of cache structures, which allow us to make this approximation or this assumption that the IMEM and DMEM are actually distinct. 
other possible types of structural hazards could for example have happened if we did not have a register file that could accept a read after write if we had a register file which could only either accept a read or a write in a given clock cycle we could end up having a conflict once again in our case we have assumed that this is not a problem and therefore we have bypassed this issue in general in more complex systems there are other possibilities of structural hazards but they depend on the kind of instructions and the kind of hardware that's being used to execute them data hazards on the other hand relate to how the different instructions interact with each other consider this example where we have two instructions an add followed by a subtract but the important point is the result of the add which is the register x1 is being used by the subtract in the very next instruction what's the problem over here if you recall how the pipeline works the x1 would get updated by the add instruction only in the write back stage of instruction 1 however we want to be able to read the same value in the id or instruction decode stage of instruction 2 pipeline diagram corresponding to the add instruction is shown here in the first cycle we fetch the instruction in the second cycle we decode in other words read the registers x2 and x3 the third cycle involves computing x2 plus x3 and we do not yet have a place to store the result in other words we can't write back into the register file yet what we do however is to store it in some temporary storage which would typically be a register as which is part of the alu or somewhere between the alu and the other blocks but not quite the register file itself how this happens will be discussed in more detail when we get to the actual implementation of pipelining in the fourth stage which is the mem stage there is nothing to be done which effectively means that the cpu is idle or does not need to do anything as far as this add instruction is concerned and then finally in the fifth stage we have write back where the value that was computed in cycle 3 gets written into the appropriate location in the register file what happens with the next instruction which is the subtract in cycle 2 the subtract instruction is fetched from memory in the next cycle we would normally have done a decode which means that we would need to fetch the values of register x1 and x5 however we have a dependency problem here x1 has not yet been updated because the previous add instruction has not yet had time to complete when will it complete only when the write back happens which means that effectively in cycle 3 the subtract instruction needs to stall it cannot get the data that it needs and therefore we need to just keep the cpu idle until the data becomes available to us what about cycle 4 the same even though the value itself was already computed in cycle 3 by the add instruction it has still not been written into the register file which means cycle 4 is also stalled finally in cycle 5 we make use of the fact that we are doing a read after write and even though the write back only happens in cycle 5 we can also safely read it back and the decoding of the subtract instruction can therefore proceed after that the subtract instruction proceeds as usual it goes through the mem stage and finally the write back stage so you can see over here that this data hazard came about because of the fact that we had this dependency between the output of the first instruction add which was x1 and one of the sources for the registers to be used in the second instruction is there a better way that we could have handled this if we look once again at the actual execution sequence we can realize that in cycle 3 the add instruction had actually completed in other words the value that we wanted x1 was already available in cycle 3 and what was it that the subtract instruction wanted to do in cycle 3 it would normally have been the decode stage which means that it just needs to fetch the value that was there in x1 not to do anything with it if that's all that we really need then perhaps we could look at forwarding this information that is to say taking the value from the alu output and directly making it available to the execute stage of the subtract instruction so that in other words the instruction decode stage of the subtract instruction 
does not actually fetch a value from the register file. It waits for the data to come directly from the ALU in the previous stage and come directly as one of the inputs to the ALU for the next clock cycle. We have effectively forwarded a result that would not yet be written for another two clock cycles so that the subtract instruction does not get penalized and does not need to wait. This does not work exactly the same way if the first instruction we had was a load instruction. This is normally called a load use data hazard. And the reason why it does not work is unlike an ALU operation where the result is available in the X EX stage itself, in the case of a load instruction, the result, that is the data memory output, is only available in the fourth cycle, that is the mem stage of the load instruction. What this means is that we would still need to stall for one clock cycle during the EX stage of the load, but then we can still do some kind of forwarding and get the data which comes from the data memory and directly make it available for the subtract instruction in cycle five. We still save one cycle of stalling because after all, normally the result would have been taken after the write back of the load instruction and then fed to the instruction decode stage of the subtract. Instead, we have managed to save one cycle, but as you can see over here, because of the structure that we have in the present case, we cannot completely eliminate a stall. Finally, control hazards. Control hazards correspond to branching instructions. And of course, branches themselves are of two types, both conditional as well as unconditional. The main problem, of course, that we have over here is in the case of a branch instruction, where are we supposed to fetch the next instruction from? The very concept of next instruction is dependent on whether or not the branch is to be taken. What this means is that we would ideally like to resolve whether or not the branch is taken as early as possible, compute the corresponding target address, and send it to the program counter. However, in general, this is not possible for multiple reasons. One is you might need to compute the branch address based on some register file outputs. The second is you might have to do some kind of an ALU operation to even decide whether or not the branch is to be taken. One simple solution, of course, is that we could stall on every branch. Wait until the decision on whether the branch is to be taken is ready and also for the target address to be computed and only then fetch the next instruction. In other words, as soon as we have fetched and a branch instruction on the very next clock cycle, while we are decoding the branch instruction, we immediately stall the CPU. We do not fetch another instruction at all. We wait until the branch has been resolved and then proceed to fetch the next instruction. Clearly, this is going to be wasteful of clock cycles, but is at least a valid solution. Since we would like to avoid wasting such clock cycles, a number of different solutions have been proposed for dealing with the problems of branching in pipelines. I'm going to very briefly mention two of them over here without going into the details because the details of the implementation are quite tricky in many of these cases. The first one is actually the easiest to implement from the point of view of hardware. It assumes that there is some concept called a delay slot. Let's try and understand this with the help of the small piece of code. As you can see, the first two instructions, add x2, x3, x4, and subtract x5, x6, x7, are followed by a branch. The assumption is that the branch instruction can be resolved at least by step three. In other words, I can decide where the target of the branch is and fetch the corresponding instruction by step four. What this means is I introduce two no operations or NOPs. A NOP is more or less the software equivalent of a stall. It means that nothing inside the CPU changes and nothing in the external memory changes as well. In other words, a NOP by definition should not have any impact on the overall state of the system other than delaying it by a single clock cycle. Now, notice that the first two instructions, the add and the subtract, use registers that are completely different from what the branch uses. 
in principle, we could consider that we could take those two instructions and move them immediately after the branch into the place occupied by the knobs. What this means is that when I get the branch instruction and while I'm waiting to compute the target of the branch and whether or not the branch is to be taken, I could continue performing two other operations, in this case, an add and a subtract, in such a way that I guarantee that the add and the subtract will always execute and will always complete, irrespective of whether or not the branch is to be taken. In the case that the branch is not taken, after the add and the subtract, I would then go through to the next instruction, which is the add x2, x3, x4. But this would not have any impact. It would have exactly the same behavior as the case where the original add and subtract were before the branch instruction. Now, this works, of course, only in the case where we have sufficient number of instructions that do not depend on the branch that can be pushed after the branch. This is something that can be done by compilers. It does not really require modifying the hardware. Of course, the hardware needs to be aware of the fact that there are delay slots. The other alternative, which has itself generated a lot of research in the field of computer architecture, is can we predict whether or not a branch is going to be taken? The simplest form of prediction would simply be to say, ignore the branch, assume that it's not going to be taken and continue. This is the simplest because we just need to do PC plus four, increment the address and go on to the next address. However, if we are wrong, we need to roll it back. The problem with this simple approach is that very often branches are actually meant to be taken. The reason for this is that a large proportion of the branches found commonly in code correspond to loops. If I have something like a for loop, which is a for loop running from zero up to 100, what I would actually find is that the loop, the branch, in other words, is taken 99 times and is not taken only once. So loops in general are a kind of code where branches are typically taken rather than not taken. Therefore, one of the common approaches to branch prediction is to assume that loops are always going to be taken. This is still a little bit more tricky because we need to find the target of the branch instruction and start loading the very next instruction from there. And we would like to do this without wasting any cycles. In general, as I mentioned, a lot of research has gone into coming up with fairly complex prediction schemes. And many of these schemes are absolutely necessary for getting the highest possible performance out of modern processors. However, we will not be going deeper into this topic at the moment.